some of the most well-known yet deadly pathological diseases are up there. And in fact, it's been recently estimated that cardiovascular disease, or CVD, accounts for 31% of UK deaths across all ages and is a major cause of long-term disability. And it's not a cheap disease to treat, and it costs the UK NHS an average of £9 billion per year on related treatment. And it is essentially branded as society's common killer. And I can guarantee that each of you here knows of someone in your close friends or family who has been affected by CVD-related illness, and more importantly, has had to undergo some form of minimally invasive surgery or catheter-based treatment to alleviate the symptoms of that disease. Now, catheters are absolutely everywhere in healthcare, though they're ever more important for cardiovascular disease treatment, whereby we're required to go inside the body, navigate throughout tortuous uh, vasculature and blood vessels, and importantly, deliver treatment deep within the body in localised parts. Whoa. Seems to go back to that one. So most of you might know about this already. So this is a traditional aortic catheter. And how it's operated is that the surgeon inserts it into the patient's neck, arm or groin, and then manually navigates this external to the patient and often guided by medical imaging such as x-ray platforms. Though, although it can be uh, really effective in some cases, like removing clots from your arteries or delivering drugs deep within your body, it does come with some significant limitations which put both the surgeon's precision and the patient's health at significant risk. And these include mental strain on the surgeon because they have to physically push the catheter throughout the patient uh, and have to concentrate in doing so. There's a risk of vessel perforation with that and damage to the patient internally as well. And also a risk of inf infection, particularly throughout repeated insertion of this catheter. Uh, and on top of that, exposure to radiation from the medical imaging equipment uh, can happen for both the patient and the surgeon alike. So in general, the, the main takeaway point here is that cardiovascular disease has become such a deep-rooted disease in our society, yet no gold standard surgical breakthrough has yet been made to rise up and meet those growing challenges. But well, hopefully, this is where we change things soon. So, I'm going to state the obvious here, and forgive me for doing so, but Finding out that you're undergoing surgery can be a blessing and a curse at the same time. A blessing in the sense that your problem or your illness could be alleviated in the long term, but a curse in the sense that you, you could be going, undergoing a, a manual and intensive procedure, which can play a lot with your mind. It can seem quite daunting. So I want you to think like biomedical engineers today, and I want you to imagine a world where, first of all, CVD catheters are patient tailored. So imagine if we could create a catheter uh, which knows how to bend exactly around the patient's anatomy within the body rather than relying on the surgeon to na uh, manually navigate that. There we go. Uh, imagine if those catheters were smart in, in their own way, so they know how to navigate throughout the body without relying entirely on the surgeon as well. And imagine that that type of treatment is completely accessible, so we can have patients coming in and potentially manufacture their catheters within 15 minutes or so and deliver their treatment straight off the bat rather than having to wait on the treatment being delivered. And considering all of those, imagine that the catheter treatment is risk-free. So it goes in, it delivers its, its drug or whatever, it does its job, and it comes back out without causing any sort of unnecessary harm to the patient. So you might be wondering now, are there any treatments or any developments out there which are trying to meet these gold standards? And I can say, yes, there are. We're currently in development. Now, enter magnetic soft tentacle robots. So if you imagine the likes of an octopus tentacle or an elephant trunk, these types of robots try and mimic the, the soft and elastic properties of those. So they're very long devices. Uh, and they can be wirelessly controlled in the sense that it's an elastic material which embeds magnetic particles, tiny, tiny magnetic particles throughout its length and it can be controlled by magnets external to the patient. So having the patient lying down on the bed and um, this type of treatment navigated throughout the body using magnets outside. So it's biocompatible, so it's non-toxic to the patient as well. And it can be patient tailored to um, the anatomy. So we could literally zap these tentacles along their length so they know exactly how to bend around different parts of the patient's body, particularly for blood vessels, as you can see up there. Though this project is very much in its infancy just now, in fact the field is very, very new, and with this comes a, a, a large range of, of challenges, including a, a lack of complex bio-inspired designs, so a lot of the tentacles you see just now are quite cylindrical, but as part of my project I wanted to actually taper them along their length, so make them thinner and thinner and see how this affects their deflection, and more importantly how this affects their stability as they're navigating throughout the body. So just to introduce you to some key assessment metrics which I use to uh, assess how clinically suitable these types of tentacles were, 
the first is tip deflection angle, and it's actually quite self-explanatory. So this is a big magnetic coil, and we put this tentacle in it, put different magnetic fields through it, and seen how much the tentacle bent, essentially. So if you imagine everyone has done this at some point, put a ruler on the end of a desk and pinged it back and forward, and you've seen how much it's bent. Um, that's essentially what this coil is doing, and we want to measure how much the tentacles are deflecting in that way. Now, the second is uh, twist, and again, it's quite self-explanatory. So when you bend the tentacle, particularly in high magnetic fields, uh, it has a tendency to twist or shift along itself, um, and it's quite an undesirable trait. So the more the tentacle is bending, the more likely it can to twist, and we want to minimise that twist as much as possible so we can uh, maximise its deflection properties. So in that, that coil we just seen there, what I've done was I bent the tentacle uh, through a range of different magnetic fields, and what you can see with the cylindrical tentacle in the blue curve there and the tapered tentacle or the octopus-like tentacle, we can achieve very, very similar deflections. So half of the problem is solved here. We can change the geometry of the tentacles, put them in the body, and it doesn't affect their deflection majorly, majorly. Although looking at twist, which is the sort of second half of this problem, um, what I've noticed here is that with cylindrical tentacles, they're very, very unstable when you put them throughout magnetic fields. Um, and twist is actually quite hard to, to quantify in general because these are soft, squishy devices. You can't really determine their behaviour through uh, the normal equations uh, which we use for the likes of beam bending and things like that. Um, so what I done was I put a series of splines of those little green dots along the tentacles and I measured how much they twisted throughout different magnetic fields. And as you can see with that thin cylindrical tentacle, um, all of those splines were completely out of, out of plane essentially, meaning that the tentacle was quite unstable throughout those magnetic fields. Um, though the thicker that the tentacle came uh, or became, and in fact at this particular taper angle here, all of those splines were actually in plane, meaning that we could deflect the tentacle to the exact same way as the previous tentacles, but in a far more stable fashion, which is essential because if you want to put this in your body, you want it to deflect as best as it can, but at the same time um, be as stable as it can so it doesn't, want to, uh, it doesn't cause any unnecessary uh, damage. As I've hopefully said, uh, current CVD catheters are significantly limited in their operational and their navigation abilities. Though magnetic soft tentacles can offer a safer and atraumatic alternative, and that's because they can be wi wirelessly controlled, external to the body. Uh, they're exceptionally soft, and they have exceptional potential for miniaturization, so you don't have to include any bulky actuation equipment on the tentacle to physically move it throughout the body. It's entirely done external to the body uh, through the use of magnets. The taper tentacles, as I've shown here, uh, achieve that key balance between achievable deflection and their reduced twist for in vivo navigation. Though future research um, may look to actually functionalise these tentacles, so we know how they bend so far, we know how to control them, but how do we actually make them useful for surgery? We could include the likes of laser ablation technology for suturing or ultrasonic technology for imaging. Uh, but in my project in particular, we don't quite know how these tentacles can bend with different weights or different uh, masses of that solid state equipment on the end of their lengths. So we want to try and include different weights on the end of these tentacles and see if they can deflect to the exact same ability as what they did when they didn't have um, any sort of weight added to them. Though in general, accessible, low cost and patient tailored catheters are the way forward. And in particular, magnetic soft tentacles show exceptional potential to supercharge research in this area. So. Thank you very much for listening and I'm happy to take any questions.